as well, particularly with respect to how women and young people access support. So essentially, I think the intention of including these forms of violence was there was good intention and there was some uh, impetus around ensuring that the broad range of experiences that women have are represented and by including them in the plan there's some impetus then around service responses. I think the desire to categorise has had then some unintended consequences where the uh, ambitious nature of including them in the plan to ensure service responses were uh, tuned in to these experiences has almost done the opposite in many ways where uh, the mainstream service provider response still hasn't had the resource or capacity building um, injected in, in order to recognise these forms of violence as something that occurs along that continuum. So women's experiences are still experiences of exclusion, of um, you know, lack of responsiveness, of uh, mechanisms like interpreters and other forms of support that are not part of business as usual everyday practice. Um, I think the other concern around the use of the word complex is that all forms of violence are complex. And why have we decided in the action plan in particular that four particular forms of that violence are more complex than others. And if we think about the motivations, the combinations of techniques, strategies employed by perpetrators, uh, it's all complex and it all presents with um, necessary considerations to be made around how we then engage in systemic as well as programmatic responses. And if we come back to our base around gender inequality being at the heart of uh, violence and being, you know, patriarchal norms and structures of societies being uh, contributing factors, my experience is that that's not very different uh, across diverse communities and the ways in which violence then unfolds uh, should not necessitate ne um, a response that then uh, stigmatises, excludes or otherizes people. And unfortunately, by creating a separate silo and giving these particular forms of violence that label, that's what we have done. And there's some real need to have that conversation, that open and honest conversation, and to build into our advocacy work and into our program responses, some consideration of the unintended consequences of what may have well been quite well-intentioned responses to ensuring that people are included, but this way of doing it hasn't necessarily rendered that result. And an acknowledgement of the various religious, cultural, communal and systemic contexts in which violence occurs is all part of understanding violence regardless of the way in which it then manifests. Thanks Laura, that's a very uh, very good overview of how the discussions have evolved over time and where are we at now and where should we be going from here? What's, what's the forward way of thinking? I think I would like to add um, that in, in addition to the patriarchal and gendered structures of all societies that we really need to keep at the heart of um, conversations about violence, we also need to talk about systemic racism and um, the wider political economic structures, including capitalism, and they are not separable. We cannot talk about gendered violence and ra systemic racism separately and then try to find solutions in that way. So it's really trying to understand how systems interact and talking about violence has to be about that sort of macro understanding rather than zooming in on certain communities and um, putting them under the microscope. So with that, I will come to you, Fatima, with, the, with my next question, because you work closely with people experiencing um, certain forms of violence, particularly FGM often described as complex forms of violence. 
What do you think is the impact of such a framing and language on the communities and victims and survivors particularly? Yes, hi. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity, Sanan and Harmony Alliance. Really appreciate being given this platform. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon I am, which is the Wurundjeri elders of the Kulin Nations. I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so my work, as you sort of mentioned earlier on, I do uh, quite a bit of sort of community work, um, not necessarily in a professional sense anymore, but more on a volunteer basis, as you mentioned, the East African foundations and other organisations. Um, predominantly with these African communities as well as Muslim communities. Um, so uh, most of what I'm about to say is, is informed by that discussions within the communities as well as I've got a background in public health and I actually did a, a thesis exploring the maternity care experiences of Somali women in Melbourne. So that'll be the, the basis for which I present this. Um, I think within, within the communities um, that have sort of traditionally had to have experienced FGM or, you know, the East African communities, as well as, the, you know, some other communities within the African nations. Um, the communities sort of feel like a lot of the discussions around FGM lack nuance and that oftentimes women are spoken for rather than consulted. And many, for example, express that they hate being referred to as mutilated bodies. So the conversation just starts even at the labelling. Um, because then all of a sudden they're, they're being spoken about, as I said, and also the, this discussion about how they're beings that are incapable of having healthy sexual lives when that's not their li lived experience. And even though my research was some time ago, that, that sort of perception still exists, despite that numerous evidence out there to suggest that that's not the case. Um, many women within the communities also express that they're often you know, seen as some kind of almost quote unquote, like a freak show within the, you know, health system where um, they feel like that they're being profiled to an extent. I've had a lot of women, it's actually happened to me. I don't even mean to say a lot of women. I've, when I was pregnant with my children at one of the major public hospitals here in Melbourne, um, almost every single time I get approached in the waiting room in front of other patients and I get asked this question, have I ever had experience of gym? That's not a discussion that you want to have in front of other people. Um, I've, one of the other things as well is about how the law frames issues around FGM or FGC, um, female genital cutting. And we all know that the law reflects the social climate within a community or a state and it plays a significant role in shaping public perceptions. So in Australia, legislation which prescribes FGM, um, if you actually look at it, it clearly directs the prohibition of cultural practices within non-Western cultural traditions. So much so, the Attorney General actually stated that exceptions cannot be gained for reasons that are ritual or traditional. So what that essentially means is that cosmetic procedures are legal, but any other form of, I guess, female genital surgery is not allowed. So then what we have is that we have a discrepancy that arises. So essentially cosmetic surgeries are permissible. For example, non-therapeutic surgeries um, done on intersex children to normalize you know, genitalia is perfectly legal. And this is, you know, just there's been quite a few recent court cases that have allowed that. On the flip side, FGC is not allowed. Now, can I just sort of say, obviously I'm not advocating for it, but what happens is that when you have this type of discrepancy, conversations within the community then turn to, is this a type of profiling? Are we being targeted specifically? And it also undermines attempts to try and eradicate this issue or to try and, you know, um, protect children, essentially. So then what happens is that because the community feel in some ways targeted by laws or mainstream discussions, they then become deeply suspicious about service providers or, for example, the health system. I mean, there are a lot of women within, I found within my research, a lot of women were saying things such as, um, you know, uh, C-sections were being conducted to make sure that we don't have many children, for example, right? So it has, it has all of these consequences that lead to negative health outcomes, potentially negative health outcomes for women within these communities. So I think what we need to start seeing is, and we've been saying this for so long, um, and you mentioned earlier on, Sana, but at some point, these discussions need to translate to action. I mean, we, we, we have the data, we have the information, our communities have been saying it for a very long time. Um, 
it's not, I, I don't know if it's an issue. It, I'm, not, I'm not so certain that it's an issue of lack of knowledge. I think it's more that it's probably put in a too hard basket, hence the label of it's complex. We'll just put it over there because we don't understand it. But I think the communities have done the legwork and we need to start implementing um, what comes out of all these discussions. Really important points, Fatum, and I couldn't agree more about um, moving to act, take action rather than talking about the labels and what it is and what it is not and whether it's complex and whether it's, you know, uh, where does it sit? We, we, we need to move beyond categorization. We need to move beyond trying to put these things into certain boxes and really start working on what we can do and the communities have done their work and they continue to suffer through this forced categorizations and the, the in, insistence on being put into boxes. The, it is the victims and the survivors who are suffering through that. I will ask my next question to you, Jatinder. You have been at the front lines of providing support, shelter, advocacy to women from South Asian backgrounds and women from South Asian backgrounds experiencing specific forms of violence, for example, dowry abuse have also been labeled as, you know, falling under the category of complex forms of violence. And while I understand I'm from a South Asian background, these practices are more prevalent in South Asian communities, but uh, what, what, um, how do we talk about the complexity? What is your understanding of the language of complexity in this context and how it disempowers women experiencing these forms of violence? instead of giving them the power. Okay. Um, thank you, Sana. Thank you to Harmony Alliance today to uh, you know, invite me to speak on the panel. Uh, it's very um, honourable. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional land on which we meet here in Queensland, the Jagara people and elders past, present and emerging. Um, this is such a big topic. <laughs> so it's like, where do I start? Um, intersectionality you know, when we look at the framework and, and the theoretical framework, it is about really understanding um, the different types of inequality. So, you know, we really need to understand the inequality of gender, race, class, language, faith, um, socioeconomic background, um, migration, and how does that play a part? Um, using the, this new terminology that the, the, the Commonwealth Government has, um, you know, put into the fourth action plan, complex forms of violence, I mean, I, I feel like they are creating a new language, a new, new discourse without actually um, framing it with the existing literature. Um, Gender-based violence is probably um, the universal language used by the UN, and I think that would have been more appropriate, because we need to think of it as a complex continuation of violence and the multiple forms of violence, so not just one aspect, um, and that different types of violence is going to vary culture to culture, ethnic background, and, and um, it's the cultural nuances that comes with that. I mean, as part of, uh, when we think about othering, I think it's really, really important to look at the structural and institutional barriers that women of uh, migrant, refugee, asylum seeker, or LGBTIQ or disability uh, background or diverse women face when seeking help in the context of family violence. So the current structural or institutional barriers that we face is that, um, and I'll be honest here, um, in my experience with supporting vulnerable women, is that our first frontline responders in the domestic violence space, sometimes they don't even have the basic skill of how to use an interpreter. I'm sorry, we're in 2020. Our police officers, our DV workers, our hospital staff, it should be a core basic human right that a woman or a victim who cannot speak English is afforded that opportunity of a professional to use an interpreter. I just feel like that this is where the othering comes in. When we think about complex forms, it's put into the too hard basket. Oh, you know, the responses that I've seen from some police officers has been, oh, this is gonna just take so much time. I don't, you know, they just don't want to be culturally responsive. They don't want to take that extra, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to actually provide 
a culturally responsive, trauma-informed uh, service delivery. So I think, you know, we need to really reframe that this is not a problem, you know, with the women seeking help. This is also a problem with the service system that we, we, we need to then look at how can the service system become more responsive to meet the needs of, um, of diverse, you know, diverse women. The notion of dowry abuse, and I guess the language of that, I mean, and, and look, uh, you know, I have lots of respect for Dr. Mandela O'Connor and I, and I work with her. I think the framing and the language um, can be quite othering because I think financial abuse occurs across all cultures. Okay, for me personally and professionally, I see the practice of dowry and dowry abuse as a manifestation of financial abuse. It's just that it has occurred in traditional cultures over, you know, centuries. And maybe, um, you know, there's different, uh, I guess, uh, presentations here in Australia, but dowry abuse also occurs in the UK, Canada, and other Western developed countries. So, you know, we need to look at within the continuum, gender-based violence, and then what are the discrete differences, but not the othering process. Um, yeah, th look, this is a big issue. And I think, you know, the, it's very complex, but I think we need to start the conversation about how do the service system actually now recognise um, that we need to step up and do a better job. Thanks, Jatinder. And really important points again, dowry abuse is a form of wider economic and financial abuse. And these sort of practices occur and happen in all cultures and communities. It's essentially about transaction and exchange that has been a part of marriage traditions around the world, including the Western marriages. If you think that exchange of rings or ex uh, the expect uh, expectation for the bride's father to um, provide for the wedding, venue reception is not cultural and not complex, but dowry abuse is complex, then um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an issue of perception and it, it is otherizing of certain cultures. And it needs to be addressed in that wider continuum of violence and wider context. Trish, um, you, work, uh, you have been working on the gendered disability violence quite specifically and that, that that work sort of lies in an area where there is an added layer of apparent complexity I mean it's it's again you know because there is um, we're talking about women with disability it is again rendered invisible and is um, called more complex because it's an added layer so dis women with disability and their experiences of violence are already being neglected and erased from wider discussions of gender-based gender violence. And this erasure is even more powerful and strong and leads to this even bigger invisibility. And yeah, can, can I please ask you to shed some light on this invisibility for us? Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Harmony Alliance, uh, for this invitation. And um, like my panelists, I would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the lands in which we meet. I'm coming to you all from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to ancestors and to elders, um, past and present. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I think it's really great that we're talking about language and we're talking about terms and we're talking about invisibility. But I suppose what I want to do today is to take us on a journey and to talk not so much about invisibility, but use the phrase invisibilization. When we talk about invisibility, there's an agentic aspect to this, that we as disabled women make ourselves invisible. When we use invisibilization, we talk about the systems, the structures and the processes by which our experiences of gendered and gender disability violences are, you know, invisible, not heard. Um, so this is not a semantic issue, it's actually an issue of epistemic value. Um, when I talk about invisibilization, I also wanted to talk about three states, a state of not of being ignored, a state of not being taken into consideration, and a state of obfuscation and obscurity of the violence we face as disabled women. So what is a state of being ignored? Well, let me begin with invisibility under the current national plan to reduce violence against women and their children. 
Now, this is a fabulous whole of government progressive document that preserves the language of violence against women. And much like Jatinder says, that is, you know, the gender based concept that comes from CEDAW and that comes from UN treaty monitoring bodies. However, nearly 10 years on from its commencement, the plan and its four action plans have largely focused on a conceptual understanding of violence against women, which is domestic and family violence. So intimate partner violence and spousal violence and sexual assault. Now, this conceptualization is limiting and problematic for disabled women. Allow me to share an example. A bit grisly, so a bit of a content warning. Um, in 2009, a disabled teenage girl had her nose almost bitten off in a sickening attack in a New South Wales government-funded group home. The young girl was unable to fend off her 22-year-old male attacker who was a co-resident in that group home. He essentially climbed up in her bed at night and assaulted her, leaving her with severe injuries, but no charges were ever laid. Now, cases such as these are not few and far between, but they're never typically characterized or treated as domestic violence. Instead, you know, we frame them as challenging behavior, as a service provider issue, and then the response tends to be one of adopting behavioral management strategies <clears throat> rather than, for example, involving the justice system or, you know, the specialist violence against women sector. So I suppose the point that I'm trying to make is that the systems we have in place to support all Australian women, victims and survivors of violence are not invoked for disabled women. And that's a problem. Um, the second um, point that I'd like to talk about is the state of not being considered. Now, this is perhaps more so in terms of how the legal system, you know, in the Commonwealth and across state and territories invisibilizes us. So for many women with disability, where we live, the domestic setting is the institutional arrangement we live in. And that includes non-private dwellings, care homes. However, violence perpetrated in these arrangements is rarely, as I said, understood as domestic and family violence. Now, if you look at federal legislation and you look at the definition of family member or you look at the definition of relative in the amended Family Violence Act, well, that is not broad enough to encompass the range of domestic relationships us, you know, disabled women may be in. There are also differences in domestic and family violence legislations across jurisdictions. So, you know, some jurisdictions provide, you know, a level of protection, but even when there are jurisdictions where domestic and family violence law, you know, covers such settings, um, it is never really well understood or acted upon by first responders or specialists from the sector. So the point I'm trying to make is for women with disability, in effect, our experiences of domestic and family violence are not being recognized and therefore in, invisibilized, if that makes sense, across the legal system. Um, the last point I'd like to make is what I talked about, a state of being obscured and obfuscated. And I, and I just want to make the point that for disabled women and girls, while domestic violence and family violence and sexual assaults are absolutely critical issues, um, the experience of gender disability violence cannot be confined to this because it risks sees, seeing other forms of violence um, you know, become obscured or obfuscated. And by that, I mean forced sterilization, you know, forced abortion, forced contraception, menstrual suppression. I mean, I could go on. Um, these are in effect gender-based violations of sexual and reproductive rights. And they're widespread practices um, against women with disabilities in Australia, especially in congregate um, settings and especially in non-private dwellings. And yet these practices are rarely subject to the oversight, the monitoring or the review of our gendered violence response and prevention architecture. So I suppose what I wanted to say today is that the rendering of our invisibility is not because we are invisible, because there is a willful manner structurally and systemically by which our experiences are invisibilized. Thank you so much, Trish, for that word, invisibilization. We need that word and we need it more than we need the phrase complex forms of violence. And I'm, I'm certainly adding that to my dictionary and we'll come, keep coming back to that. And on that, um, 
following up on that invisibilization um, or the forced erasures and acts of rendering invisible through language, I would like to um, come back to Laura and ask you, um, we know that these um, invisibilization and these acts of forced erasure are related to decision makers' evasion of responsibility to address systemic and structural factor, factors that contribute to or enable violence against women, whether it's um, violence in the uh, reproductive rights space or um, whether it's the violence in, in the right to freedom or anything. So, Laura, would you like to reflect on how this um, invisibilization and the res uh, evasion of responsibility that comes with it, uh, how it impacts the policies and responses designed to address forced marriage and trafficking in particular? Mm. It's such a big question. And I actually wrote an email to somebody yesterday saying, you know, the, the challenge that I have with this is because on one hand, we absolutely need a more responsive, nuanced and um, balanced response and service delivery approach to these issues. But unfortunately, the way in which it has unfolded has meant that decision makers are ultimately yielding considerable power over how those responses are delivered. And in fact, moving legislation to allow them to make those decisions without consultation, without review, without an evidence base and hand picking uh, off an agenda who will best be placed to deliver against those objectives. And when we, I almost feel a little bit guilty in the sense that, um, the advocacy around including things like forced marriage and um, a servile marriage and other forms of trafficking within the broader spectrum of violence against women has in many ways sort of backfired because the response has been licensed actually to some decision makers to uh, go forth and deliver a response without actually doing those fundamental consultation and evidence gathering steps which discern how a community would like to engage and how a community understands their own uh, challenges and uh, ensures that what is being offered or the service delivery response is what they need when they need it and how they need it so I think the framing of these forms of violence, if we go back to the very beginning, is the otherization creates the invisibility and then we yield power and we say, oh, but you, you wanted this. You said we need more sustained action or community engagement on this issue, but uh, that's not actually what we meant when we said that. So in some ways I feel a little bit guilty because the opportunities to engage are so few you can't get into that balanced, nuanced level uh, that you need to. And then there's a response and it's almost like we're supposed to be congratulating people for that response when in actual fact, we needed the follow-up step uh, in between what we ask for and what we advocate for and then what ends up happening. So the, recognize, the recognition of power and privilege in the decision-making process uh, from my perspective and from my experience is entirely missing in that discourse and the simplification then of, oh, well, you know, forced marriage, human trafficking, it's gender-based violence, it's violence against women. So, uh, oh, this organisation appears to do this work or this person appears to do this work. We can kind of check that box and say, you know, job done. And then it becomes a very governance related function as opposed to, really getting into what meaningful and sustained action is in that regard. Can I um, just make one more point following Laura's point? Just want to highlight, is that okay? Yeah. Um, I think one thing that I've seen is when the evidence has been put forward to say the federal government, and I'm gonna use the example of the Senate inquiry into dairy abuse, we had over 80 um, submissions made to that inquiry. We had three um, uh, 
hearings in three across three different sittings and I you know I personally made a submission and also gave evidence at one of the the, the Sydney hearing we have 12 recommendations sitting there as of February 2019 we have not had any response from the federal government about whether they're going to adopt them but one of the key ones that is related to this topic uh, which was recommendation five, which was to create a temporary visa, woman at risk visa in Australia for onshore and to enable women who become victims of you know, domestic or family violence in Australia to give them a two year window to mm. be able to get their life back on track. That's not hard. All the federal government has to do is to change the Migration Act. There are things on the table that the federal government can do right here, right now, and they're choosing to cherry pick mm -hmm. which um, initiatives, which recommendations. And so, you know, as an advocate, and I guess as a social worker on the front line, it is extremely frustrating when we collect the case studies, we prepare the submissions, we give evidence, you know, of good, solid, this is what needs to be done. There's no action. Mm. So where's our recourse? So I totally agree with you, Laura. I think, you know, at what point then do does our political system yeah. um, silence um, these sort of issues or the too hard basket issues that are too political or, you know, they're not important or we're going to cherry pick which one we want to sort of touch on? Mm. Yeah. And I think, you know, just to sort of round out that point, what we've seen increasingly actually is a politicisation of responses to violence against women and, you know, responses to all kinds of social problems. And from my experience, it is then the politicisation of that service delivery, mm -hmm. the consequence of that, which is often not spoken about and often, um, you know, almost the elephant in the room around who and how and when are people equipped, resourced and empowered to deliver a service and how does the community, uh, how is the community consulted around whether or not the chosen mechanism is actually going to be what they want mm. and need because mm. then we are almost at a null and void point because you can put money into something and you can check the box to say, yes, we had a response to this issue that we care about, but then the community didn't engage. So then that's the community's fault. They don't want to, they don't want this help or they don't want to change. And it kind of goes back to the original point that was being made there about, it's not about women not wanting to engage or women not wanting uh, support it's actually about what it is that's provided and we've politicized that entire environment and I think that's the real shame beyond the power of language is also the unintended consequences of how structured service delivery mm -hmm. then impacts on when how and if people get the kind of support that they want and need. I really, I really um, appreciate the points you have made about bureaucratization and this almost inhumane or and disconnected governance on the one hand and the deeply political, politicized responses in service delivery at the same time. So the, the image or the illusion that we are being given is that bureaucracy is unconcerned, neutral, apolitical, disconnected from the ground level and just doing its job and governing but at the same time it is very actively and very politically silencing certain experiences and keeping certain people out and actively excluding actively invisibilizing as well at the same time so it's really important and i would like to move on to a slightly different point which is also i think similarly uh, really important but doesn't get talked about often and that is media representation yes systemic and structural barriers are a major issue but the wider societal perceptions and media representation are also what drive the political action and what drive bureaucratization of certain things and, and the responses that we see in the policy space so i'll ask you um fatima to reflect a little bit on um 
how stigmatization of communities and victims of violence um, and, the, and the role of media representation in shaping wider social perceptions and other rising of these communities. How important do you think the role of media is in empowering or disempowering um, victims and survivors of uh, different forms of violence? Yeah, um, obviously, I think we can all agree that the media plays a crucial role in how just all different types of communities are shaped or viewed within society. And that's no different to Muslim women specifically, who I'm going to talk about. Um, I think we can also agree, I mean, for a lot of people who haven't had experiences in dealing with Muslim women, um, that if you just go by media representation, certainly from my point of view, I think they would get this perception, number one, of a woman in a headscarf, a woman who's helpless, a woman who's oppressed, and one who needs saving. So essentially what it does, the media representation of Muslim women, certainly not only in Australia, but a lot of um, Western nations, is that it entrenches them as perpetual victims who don't have their own agency. Um, I was just recently watching the, I don't know if many of you have watched Janet King, um, that's a Netflix series. And the only time a Muslim woman appears and she, she's helpless, right? She has no agency. She's not really following what's happening. She's always behind the eight ball. And it's not just in that, show, it's literally almost every single show that I come across, whenever there's a Muslim woman in a headscarf, she's not cluey about what's happening around her and she's been saved. Um, so that also translates, when you, it translates to gender-based violence, is that whenever the victim is a Muslim woman, her hijab becomes the focal point. Her culture, her religion becomes the focal point. And so what happens is that any other, or other contributing factors, which are probably shared with, you know, all sorts of communities are somehow neglected. I'll give you an example. In 2016, I'm not sure if many of you would remember, but there was a woman here in Broad Meadows um, and she was killed by her husband. She was a young mother of three children. Her husband um, had mutilated her body and she was found in a local park. Next to her was a brown headscarf. So, and the police were obviously trying to identify who this person was. Um, the case obviously went to court. The prosecution argued that the reason that he killed her was because she refused to go with him to Syria to fight alongside ISIS. This was rejected by the court and that they didn't accept that that was the primary reason for him killing her. What was interesting, however, was the ensuing media analysis. The whole conversation became about her faith, it became her headscarf, and all of a sudden, an issue of gender-based violence, a man who'd killed this young mother in front of her three children, became a discussion about ISIS and terrorism, right? So on the flip side, you then have, you know, situations where, or discussions of Muslim women who experience gender-based violence, their faith becomes, so it's either, it's either completely ignored or it becomes the only part within the discussion. So this over-culturalization of violence when the victim is a woman of color or a Muslim woman is problematic as it places the burden on us as the community. We always have to justify, have to explain when there could be various other contributing factors why she, she has experienced family violence. Um, and so in, in focusing and in only making that the focus, the victims don't get the help that they actually need. Um, and it's also a problem for those of us that work within the community who are from the community because we're stunted. You know, so when that becomes a comment, it's not really helpful. So yeah, certainly that's been my experiences and that's how the media contributes and shapes to how the Muslim woman is seen. So you often get, even myself, you know, less more so in Melbourne now, but I remember certainly when I was younger, I'd be working in a public hospital and I'd have slightly older patients who want to save me, for example. So I don't have to wear the headscarf. It's not seen as a choice. Um, so all of these things contribute to that perception of Muslim women. Yeah. Thanks, Fatima. And a really important perspective. Again, we need to talk about wider societal percep perceptions and how they are shaped and how they shape policy responses in, in turn, because it's a cycle. The politicians say something and people believe something and then people believe something and politicians say something to appease them. And in the whole process, it is the it is the people who are otherized that keep uh, getting left out and left um, unattended when they're victims of violence and there are no, no appropriate ways of talking about that violence. There are no appropriate ways in the discourse more broadly. Jatinder, can you please, uh, so I, you have been talking a lot about um, the service provision and the gaps there. Yeah. 
um, I would like to um, ask you to um, uh, reflect a little bit more on how you think the service provision gaps can be addressed. And I know you have already hinted at cultural responsiveness, um, embedding intersectionality at the frontline work, but can you offer some more practical sort of guidance for what can actually happen at the front lines in service provision to address these gaps? Okay. I think if we look at how domestic, family and domestic violence um, operates in Australia, usually police are the front line. So if there's any take home message, I would want to have ensure that all the frontline office police officers actually have half a day <laughs> proper culturally responsive training, not some online module, because this requires you know, them to actually unpack some of their biases, some of their stereotypes, you know, understand uh, power and privilege, especially white privilege, and also recognize that yes, institutional racism does exist. And then how does that impact on women or victims of diverse backgrounds, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, communities in seeking help? So, you know, that would be the first step. The second step, I would say, you know, even within our social work profession, and I'm a proud social worker, um, I still believe that the discourse and the level of training and, um, you know, that's required to really um, challenge, you know, systems and racism and institutional, um, you know, so how do, what does it mean to be an advocate for your client, to really put yourself in the client's shoes and actually really understand how does language, culture, financial status uh, really impact on vulnerable clients and their ability to navigate the system. So I'll give you an example. With uh, a lot of the Indian women that I support, they usually come out here on a partner visa, um, you know, for, through an arranged marriage um, in their country of origin, and then their husbands sponsor them. When they come to Australia, they are not, no one, no service actually reaches out to them and say, hey, this is Australia. These are your rights. This is where you can actually access English. So um, in other migration programs like the Refugee Humanitarian Program, um, as part of the settlement, they get orientation to Australian services. But we have large number of migrants, you know, including Indian and Chinese who come to Australia, who they've not given any orientation on how to, where to, to get help or seek help. We have two legal systems. So for domestic violence, we have local magistrate court and for child custody or uh, property divorce, that's family law court. Um, a lot of my work sometimes is about explaining there's two different court systems, there's two different legal systems. And you know, just because you've had one piece of paper in one court system, you have to then navigate the next system. Um, I'll be honest, I find professionals sometimes don't want to spend that extra 10, 15 minutes or allocate that extra time. Um, it shouldn't just be like we've set up, you know, Sahara House and we've been running and it's the first domestic violence refuge for Indian women and we've been running for three years. We don't receive any government funding, but we get a lot of referrals from police, DV sector, the statewide, even interstate. So we provide a culturally responsive, flexible service for our women so that they uh, have a place of safety and, you know, we give them the, the skills to be able to live independently and, and move and transition independently um, to, you know, whatever their future uh, prospects are going to be. But when I speak to some of the, the DV refuges or the, the DV practitioners, sometimes, um, how I articulate how we do our framework, it seems like it's a foreign language to them. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, this is a great conversation starter, but I, that really self-reflection is really, really important for service providers to really look at, okay, do we have diversity in our workforce? Are we, is at the number of women seeking our service reflecting the community population demographics. If you're a DV service or a community service 
in um, a, a highly a migrant a population density area, you should then statistically have that po a population cohort accessing your service. So if you're not seeing them come through your service, that means that you are not actually engaging with the hard to reach cohort or you are not being responsive or not making those vulnerable communities or women or people who need help aware of your services. Um, so many of our women don't know that they can access, you know, Centrelink or don't know about um, free services that are available. So there's a lot of misinformation out there and they really struggle with that. So I think, I think I've rolled off probably about 10 um, <laughs> points here for the service sector. Uh, I'm sure there'll be contentious points about, you know, um, those points, but I think let's start with the basics first. Yeah. Thank you, Jatinder. And that's a really good um, sort of um, introduction into where we can start looking, looking to address these concerns at a practical level and I'm sure we'll have a more we'll have more discussion on this and I will move on to Trish and Trish you get to answer my last question for today and after that we will open the questions um, the space to the audience and we'll take questions from them. Um, Trish as a woman of color with disability coming from a cultural background that is often stigmatized, otherized, dismissed, disempowered, invisibilized through the discourse of complexity, what do you think an intersectional understanding of violence against women means and how can it be incorporated into policy? Wow, well, no, no pressure. pressure. <laughs> um, well, I think, let me start by making it really clear that um, a diversity lens is not an intersectional approach. And um, my fabulous feminist colleagues at the Australian Violence Against Women, and I'm going to read out what they say. They say that the actions indicated in the fourth action plan can be described as taking a, a diversity approach. A diversity approach in the context of reducing violence against women involves the identification of diverse groups of women. However, that is the first step. So I think an intersectional approach, we need to decouple it and to move it away from a diversity and inclusion agenda and approach. Um, how do we ensure that we have an intersectional approach to gender disability violence? I think there are a um, couple of things. Firstly, we need to recognize that an intersectional approach to violence against women and girls with disability recognizes that we do not experience violence as members of a homogenous group. You know, it's the same with First Nations women, the same with migrant and refugee women, women who are asylum seekers. We are um, a broad community, if you wish, of women who have different functional impairments, who have, you know, different forms of disabilities. And so it's important not to homogenize us, but to look at us as individuals um, with multidimensional layers of identities, of religion, of race, of statuses, of, you know, life experiences. Um, conceptualizing violence in the, con in the context of disabled women and girls means acknowledging these lived realities. Um, it also means acknowledging that our experiences of disadvantage are not because of some inherent vulnerability. We are not inherently vulnerable, but because of and imposed by multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. Um, I'm also going to talk about the elephant in the room because we never hear this in violence against women discourse, but ableism is the absolute foundation of the inequality and discrimination um, that underpins the violence um, that women and girls with disability face. And, you know, the short answer is that women and girls with disability, for them, for us, sorry, gender inequality and disability inequality are inseparable and they're interlinked. Now, what can we do to ensure that we have an intersectional approach at the policy level? Well, firstly, we strongly, and we is my organization, strongly recommend that any new national plan to reduce violence against women preserves the language of violence against women. And I think this is consistent with what Jatinda was saying, because that language is consistent with and reflects Australia's international human rights obligation. And furthermore, kind of acknowledges that violence against women occurs on a continuum and it spans interpersonal and structural violence. 
And it also acknowledges structural and institutional inequality. So that's really, really important. What is the third thing that we can do to mainstream an intersectional approach? Well, I think it is high time that we stop seeing gender disability violence only in the context of the disability service system, you know, because when we do that, what happens is that the incidences or the prevalence of violence is sanitized. And, you know, I said this before, you, you think of it as service um, incidents, and then you start talking about imputed vulnerability, you start talking about the failure of the service system, you, you know, you start talking about, you know, dodgy service providers. Well, it's not dodgy service providers, it's patriarchy, it's gender, it's disability, and they all intersect. Um, and finally, um, what can we do to ensure um, we have an intersectional policy approach? And this is my probably my most policy wonky thing that I'm going to say today. But we have a great opportunity this year in Australia. We're at the precipice of a new national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, and also a new national disability strategy. What do we need to do? We need to ensure that the new national plan has a really strong disability lens and the new national disability strategy has a really strong gender lens. And the way to do that, three ways. Ensure that the goals, the measures, and the language are A, consistent, B, overlapping, and C, mutually reinforcing. So um, that's my magic wand wish list. Thank you so much, Trish. And that answers, uh, answers some of the questions we have been getting about how do we do intersectionality in policy and when we're talking about violence against women as well. Um, I think there was a question, question from Rashmi Kumar from uh, our watch. What are the possibilities and limitations of using intersectionality as a way to overcome these tendencies of othering, stigmatization, invisibilization, technocratic bureaucratization, et cetera, in policy discourse. So there is your answer, Rashmi. Do you think there is a risk that the term framing of intersectionality might become part of this dominant discourse? Um, we can answer that in um, with the other questions. Maria, I would like to um, ask you to wrap up the discussion if um, you have anything to add, and then we can take questions um, as we um, go. Look, I, I don't want to take up too much time because I think these wonderful women have canvassed such a full spectrum and range of positions. I suppose I'd like to kickstart it by saying that I think in the very, very long time that I have spent working in this sector, reflecting on models, reflecting on frameworks, on conceptual approaches and so on, it saddens me greatly that in 2020 we're here almost kind of talking about the same things. And I think it's important to understand that, that discourse has to be part of action. Whilst it's really important that we host panels like this, what I think needs to happen with these conversations is they need to start manifesting or being deeply embedded in practice. And I wonder what the, what the barriers are to achieving that. Because it seems that we've, you know, Jatinda, you and I have worked in this area, probably worked with most of you in this area for quite a long time, but the sort of over-culturalization to, to such an extent that I think there's now a cultural pathology about how we provide explanations around family and domestic violence in this country. But we spent so long in the kind of first part of the, uh, the initial entry into, hey, what about cowed women, so to speak? We spent a long time trying to debunk culture as causal of family and domestic violence, whilst at the same time, though, emphasising that culture did play a role in how women made decisions about the kinds of options that were available to them. And that then sort of meant, though, it was at the expense of structural analysis, that then we weren't understanding how women were being minoritised, inv invisibilised, all the amazing, you know, concepts and ideas that we've got. I, I think that ultimately now we have to really highlight that it's time for policy, practice, legislation to embed practical practical ideas of intersectionality and how it does impact on addressing 
the very real needs of migrant and refugee women across the country. But I, I wondered if I could put this as an initial question, Sana, to people, and I was sharing this with all of you just before uh, we started. I was on a panel only a few months ago where I was talking about, I guess, how this recognition of different forms of violence do not inevitably need to lead to a, a, an over-culturalisation of, of, of gendered violence against women. And, um, and one, one woman actually directly challenged me and said, look, on the one hand, you want us to take culture and cultural sort of competencies have become part of, you know, our organisational response. And now you're telling me that we're over-culturalising. Is there a balance? I mean, this is the thing. We want to emphasise the universality of violence against women and children. At the same time, we want to recognise the very unique and structural aspects of those experiences. How might we achieve that balance? in a way that doesn't then meet with a backlash, I'd say. I think I experienced a backlash at that panel where I was, I was ultimately accused of confusing service providers. Any thoughts on that as we sort of open it up to conversation? But can I just thank you all? Because I think, wow, it, it just is, there's no excuse now really, is there, out there to argue that this is an under-researched, under-voiced, under-captured area of work. I can only thank all of you for, for the learning I just uh, developed right now. But, but the balance, I wonder if I could open it up, Sana, and I'll, I'll hand it back to you, really. I've quite enjoyed just uh, listening and learning. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Um, and it's open to all the panel, whoever would like to put their hand up and answer Maria's question to start with. <laughs> Jatinda? All right. Um, I think when it comes to language, we need to think about um, who is the other, you know. I, that's just, we've got to start with that premise. Um, and whether, whatever we do, from a policy and a practice perspective, is it inclusive, inclusive of everything? And, you know, we've got to think about the notion of open door policy, not multiple doors or no wrong door. So any service provider should have that as your framework, your practice framework or your, your sort of um, your approach that anyone, whatever they present with, that they're not turned away because it's too hard, too complex, or we're not funded to do that. So I think the whole othering process, we need to move away from it because I think in Australia, depending on which era you're in <laughs> and whoever's in politics and, and you know, we can see, you know, some of the language around, you know, even um, the discourse that was a Black Lives Matter movement. Well, yeah, we have Aboriginal Lives Matter here in Australia, but very few of the politicians were wanting to actually really critically reflect on, um, we have a black history in Australia, you know? So the othering process, we, we need to be true to that and understanding power, white privilege, white in institutions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how does racism manifest itself? Even if you have the best intentions, um, mm -hmm. you, you've got to be mindful of that. And, and Jatinda, can I just say, though, that, and, and I might be, you know, inflaming a conversation here, but yeah. can I say, look, othering for me is not an accident. It's a deliberate strategy. Yeah. Yeah. It's obviously designed to create the us-them dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, inclusive, exclusive. I mean, that's, that's, let's face it, othering mm. isn't accidental in my view. And if it is, then it's simply reflective of the degree of, of structural bias that exists in the way that we respond to these issues. So could it be argued that we're actually deliberately othering migrant refugee women in this discussion here because, hey, let's face it, their needs are just too hard? <laughs> I'll let the other ones um, okay. uh, respond to that on. one. <laughs> yeah, I think we need to address these harder questions about, yeah. you know, why we, why do we keep doing this? Why do we keep doing this? Laura, Laura. sorry, yeah. Sarah, Sana. And at the risk of kind of sounding a little bit too academic here, I think mm. one of the challenges is that 
we don't apply the same definition of intersectionality, you know, across our policy platforms. I think, um, you know, intersectionality as an approach is really about not only understanding, but applying intersecting experiences. And I think my interpretation, and, you know, I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong, but the way in which the government is using the term intersectionality, the way in which the National Action Plan uses intersectionality, they use the term, they don't apply the principles. And so this sort of backlash, essentially, that you've experienced or this kind of counter narrative or debate around you're asking us to acknowledge universality, but then you're also asking us to acknowledge, you know, specific and unique experiences. Well, that's intersectionality. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like uh, we do not have a common understanding about what we mean when we use that word. We use that word in a policy context because we think we have to, but the principles that it entails and the original conception of that theory of intersectionality is about doing all of those things. So coming back to that point that you really, you know, made so eloquently around, you know, discourse has to be part of action. If we don't understand the discourse, we mm -hmm. don't know how to put it into action. Absolutely. And I agree. And I'm going to jump in and say, Laura, here, here. And I think part of the reason why we can't put the discourse into action is because, as I said, the discourse is the diversity discourse. It just mm -hmm. uses the intersectional mm -hmm. name. It is not intersectional. And earlier this year, the fabulous Professor Kimberly Crenshaw just blew my mind because she put this tweet on where she said, intersectionality is not additive. It is fundamentally mm -hmm. reconstitutive. Mm -hmm. And what we have in policy documents when we talk about intersectionality, I'm going to say it again, is diversity. So First Nations women go into the mix. Disabled women go into the mix. Migrant and refugee women go into the mix. You know, so it's like, you know, add us in and stir. Well, no. Intersectionality is reconstitutive. Diversity is additive. Mm. Or could it be argued that diversity is simply a statement of fact? It does nothing more not, than yeah. a statement of fact. Mm. What we need to be doing is moving past that to look at how those relationships actually impact on power, access to power, inclusion, exclusion, all of those dynamics, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Fatima, did you want to say something to that or um, should we start taking questions from the audience? Sorry, Maria, I'm sidelining you. <laughs> Sorry, Sana, we can take some questions. Okay, and the first question is actually for you, um, Fatima, so you can keep yourself unmuted. Um, the question is from Sue uh, Giuliani, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. I live and work in a regional area where we have a small group of South Sudanese families that have chosen to settle here. There are very limited services and that have um, here that have had experience with working with women from this cohort and no face-to-face -face interpreters that service providers can access. And I'm fearful that many of their needs or concerns are not being addressed. When there are reports of family violence to police here, the police have no understanding of their culture. And as a result, their response is compromised and this can often have devastating impacts on these families. How can we support these families and how can we address this concern? I guess the, the essential part of this question is um, remote and regional area service provision as well, but also the wider um, the the wider issues in service provision that we have been talking about and Jatinda you have raised earlier as well. So, what would you like to say to that? Yeah, this actually reminds me. Many years ago, I did some work with um, the South Sudanese communities of the Gippsland region here in Victoria, and it was when they first moved into the area. And many of the challenges that you describe were exactly the same challenges um, that they'd experienced back then. I think, obviously, you know, the lack of, you know, interpreting services makes it fundamentally far more complex. However, you'll find, um, obviously, that there'll always be some people who can sort of speak English to a, a degree where service um, providers can actually uh, communicate some of these issues. I think it would be really helpful to conduct um, genuine community consultations and 
by well, the reason that I say genuine is because oftentimes these consultations are done, but the experiences shared by these communities aren't equally valuable for service providers. You know, it's, it's almost like a tick box. Yep, we've consulted the community, fantastic. I think you will find that you'll gain a lot of invaluable um, insights from the communities. I think also it's important for service providers to challenge their own biases and perceptions about these communities. I think, um, as I was talking about earlier on, media representation makes a massive difference. And sometimes it's subconscious. We like to think that it hasn't sort of seeped into our own minds, but it does. I think it's important for service um, providers to challenge that. And also, I think it's important to recognise that being well-meaning doesn't always translate to good service delivery, right? So hence, you know, consulting the communities. Um, I know we did talk about, you know, di you know, diversity, but I think representation is really, really crucial. I, I find that with a, a lot of um, the communities that I work with, they're more likely to engage with a, a, you know, a service delivery provider when they see a face like them. Do you know what I mean? There's a trust issue. There's an entire history that I don't want to get into. And obviously because of all, all that transpires in the media or in the community, and I've talked about it earlier on, some of these hesitations are alleviated by seeing somebody that looks just like them and understands their experiences. And I don't mean in a tokenistic sense. I mean, somebody that can actually address their concerns or act as that go-between. Um, and finally, I think I find my, I, I, from my experiences anyway, there's this perception that they should be grateful grateful as a grateful migrants or grateful refugees Australia has given you a home um, and so any concerns that they often raise are put and I'm not going to say it's across the board for everybody but I've certainly seen it that they're being ungrateful because now they have a home I think those kind of and they're the kind of biases and perceptions I was talking about that, that need to be addressed um, and so they need to just be seen as it, it equals whose you know experiences are of value to service delivery Um, does anyone else want to add to that? No? Okay. Um, there is a question uh, for you, Trish, I think. Um, and it's from Anu Krishna. She's asking, would you like to understand how practitioners can raise awareness about how the agency of young women with a disability is managed by both parents and carers in institutional settings? There is a conscious denial of women with disab disability having any sexual, intimate, personal feelings and needs, and their sexual and gender identity needs to be erased. Oh, absolutely. Um, and Anu, thank you for asking that question. It's you know, it's 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 really important, and you know, I didn't get time to talk about this, but there are some. If you look at some of the transcripts of the Disability Royal Commission, where people, especially women, gave evidence, um, the evidence in micro microaggressions for example is incredible and I think it's it's interesting because when you talk about especially young disabled women in institutional settings much like older disabled women in in institutional settings you know they're either seen as completely inanimate asexual objects or on the other hand highly sexually promiscuous so you know you can't win now in terms of agency um, I'd like to talk about this further and, you know, perhaps we take this offline, but having said that, I do think that there is a problem. There is a problem in how we deny, especially young women with cognitive impairment in congregate settings, um, their absolute rights to sexual and reproductive health. We deny them their legal capacity. And sometimes when we talk about substitute decision making, for example, that's actually a buzzword for the service providers, um, their sort of needs overriding the younger woman's agency. So this is an absolute issue. Do I have a um, silver bullet for it? No, but I think the crux of my answer is that um, you know, the denial of you know, women's autonomy, especially in, in sexual and reproductive health, is it, it, it's an absolute nightmare in congregate settings. Thanks, Trish. And I'm just reading through some of the comments that are um, coming in the chat box as well and echoing what you're saying um, about agency and 
the agency being removed and not seeing not being seen i think we have about seven minutes to go i'm really struggling to decide which questions to take and which ones to um leave for later um i think um just in the interests of having a by a different um sort of question i'll take this one um about the role of um dedicated muslim women's organizations and i guess that applies to other community-led organizations and other ethnic community um, groups as well and what is their contribution and what, what sort of role can they play in attending to um, domestic violence as the main problem for women or uh, highlighting the gendered um, ethnic or violence trying to demystify the cultural um, aspects and i guess it in some ways it does come back to um the point about is it the community-led organization's responsibility to continue and keep um, trying to explain this problem? But um, I understand that they are really significant and crucial to this, to understand that to the wider understanding and discourse around this problem. And in some ways, they have a very critical position. So, how do you think they can contribute to the conversation? All right, I'll, I might just comment, even though I'm not from the Muslim community, but I do work quite closely with um, the Islamic Women's Association um, in Queensland. And certainly before we set up Sahara House, we looked at their Sakina domestic violence um, setup, um, which was running for a good couple of years, but on a volunteer basis. Um, I think for any ethno-specific organisation, so whether it's Muslim faith-based or even Indian-based, um, um, or even African, um, Australian African, or any other Asian or cultural specific, there's a real risk then you end up having all of those um, clients um, being forwarded to your service. And then it kind of gives the, the mainstream services, um, they put their hands up, oh, we don't have to deal with this, we will just send them all to you. So then the ethno-specific services become overburdened. So part of, um, because at the moment we are not funded and I have volunteers who uh, provide our service, I've had to really push back and, and do a lot of education then of the professionals and, and try to upskill, you know, some of the, I guess, um, other agencies to try and step up um, or be more culturally responsive or, you know, whether it's, you know, providing professional development to them or assisting them in being uh, more culturally sensitive because we as a non-funded service cannot take all the clientele. And I would say the same for, I think uh, certainly those were the challenges um, that I had seen for um, the Muslim specific organizations too. So um, it's a two edged sword and it's quite complex. Um, and then what happens is then you, you know, um, yeah, it, it, it has its own challenges. Yeah. And, and I'll just chime in as somebody who hasn't worked at an ethno-specific um, organisation but has always worked with diverse women and I have really valued that the ethno-specific organisations are prepared, willing to support and build capacity of other services because my experience in supporting women in that way is that um, they need choice. And if they land themselves in a service that they like and that's working for them, we have a responsibility to ensure that our service is appropriate and inclusive and doing all of the things that they deserve, not only just that they should expect, but that they deserve. And so um, the other thing about choice is that I've also worked with some women who have had you know, particularly in the human trafficking and slavery space, some very, um, very difficult um, experiences with people in their community. And for them, it was really important to be in a service or be engaged with professionals 
that they felt like would never engage with their community and, you know, in order to protect their safety and their identity. And whilst we always had a policy around, um, you know, cultural connections and community engagement, that was always a choice for the women that we were working with because some of them outright did not want that at that particular point in time because that was about their own assessment of risk and safety. So for me, I think my experience has shown we need it all and we all need to work together and we need to be supporting each other. And if we are siloing that service delivery response in the same, in the way that you've explained Jatinda as in, oh, you know, everybody just goes then to the ethno-specific service, we are doing a disservice and we are essentially replicating the silos that are being created by government and in policy and legislation that says these people are over there and that's where they get their response from, not that we all have a responsibility to ensure that people get what they deserve. Thank you, Laura. And that really brings us back to the main topic of the discussion as well. It's like saying, it is too complex, deal it with over there, we can't deal with it. So it, it is really about that. And I'm mindful of time, we have one minute to wrap up and we'll use that one minute to thank everyone who has joined us today and thank all the wonderful panelists. I have learned a lot through this whole series. We have had some amazing uh, women join us and the audience have been so engaging as well. Like the kind of comments and questions we have been getting, it's just been a really, vibrant and rich discussions throughout. Um, we really hope to continue seeing um, this sort of engagement with Harmony Alliance in our work going forward as well, even if it's not a part of this series of discussions, but in, in some form, we will continue talking about these issues um, and hopefully try, trying to turn, it, turn the discourse into action as well. Marie, do you want to wrap up um, and say some final words? Well, Sana, just to reiterate what you've just said, really, um, you know, I'd also like at some stage to have a discussion about the, uh, the misuse and the over misapplication of this word culture and the belief that it's synonymous with ethnicity, but that's for another time. Um, but truly, what an extraordinary panel. I think that's just been reiterated by all the comments that I've seen. But Sana, can I also thank you because these uh, series of discussions have really been so seamless and successful, largely because of all the work that gets done before even this can happen. So thank you for all the investment and the personal effort I know that you've gone to in making these a reality. Thanks so much. I'm sending you virtual chocolates as we speak. Um, thanks again to all of our panelists. I think that it has been a tremendous discussion and the Twittering is going crazy out there. So uh, <laughs> it's just an indication of how wonderful you've all been. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you all. Bye.